So hello everybody, my name is Carla and I'm an application security engineer. Today I'm going to be talking about hacking habits. Now because I'm a security engineer, I'm going to clarify that this is about hacking people habits and not hacking tips. If you would like hacking tips, I highly recommend following Jason Haddix. He is a um, he was a lead security uh, researcher at Bug Crowd and he has a lot of great tips. Um, but anyway, it's really quickly about me. Like I said, I'm an application security engineer. I have strong interests in human computer interaction, ubiquitous computing, and of course security. Um, and I started here four years ago um, as a quality assurance engineer. Um, and I actually didn't know how to put a program in Python walking through the doors. Um, I also didn't know how to help get 200 engineers to complete work um, in a timely manner, and I also didn't know how to get about a company, we were about 800 at the time, to adopt a security habit. So today I'm going to talk about how, to, I'm going to break down a habit, I'm going to talk about how I hacked habits across engineering, um, and since it's a Python meetup, I'm going to talk about sets and default set. And um, I'm going to also talk about how I hacked a habit across an international company. So, the very first rule of hacking is actually understanding your target. If you do not understand your target or how it works, you pretty much have no way of improving or even breaking into it. So, for example, when hacking a website, you have to understand how websites work or how the internet works. If you are penetration testing a physical building, you have to understand how lock mechanisms work. You have to understand how doors work. And if your point of entry is the air duct, you probably want to know how those work too. So, um, in this case, um, my target was human habits and um, engine, uh, so sorry, we're explaining habits right now. Um, so human habits um, allow us to be less exhausted as humans. There are three main things to know about habits, which is um, new actions take a lot of willpower. So for example, if you say hello to me in French, it's gonna take me a couple extra cycles to, re to re realize, oh, you're saying hello to me in French. Oh, I should say hello back in French. It takes a couple of extra cycles, so that's extra willpower. On the other hand, established habits actually take less willpower. So you say hello to me, it's an automatic response, I say hello back, I don't even have to think twice about it. The third thing to know about habits is that habits exist in a feedback loop. That feedback loop looks like a trigger, so um, it starts with a reminder which prompts me to execute the behavior um, and that leads to some sort of reward. So you say hello to me, I say hello back. We've had, a pleasant, we've had a pleasant conversation and interaction, therefore completing the habit feedback loop. Um, so if you want to incite behavioral change, um, you'll need three things. First off is motivation. Somebody must understand why the change is needed or how it will improve on something. You'll need the ability, so how easy it to, is it to do? Are they able to create, to, to complete the behavior? Or do they even have time, like resources? Do they have the resources to create, to actually act on the behavior? Finally, it's a trigger which exists in the feed feedback loop. Um, the trigger serves as a reminder to act upon the behavior and that gets supported by the ability and the motivation. With these three things, behavioral change can be enacted in two ways, one of which is by replacing one part of the habit feedback loop or introducing an entirely new feedback loop altogether. So how did I do this at scale across an entire organization? Um, in this case, the target was engineering feedback, uh, sorry, engineering habits, and there was a point in time where we had a lot of open tickets, and I wanted to work with the organization to reduce the number of open tickets that we had. So, um, motivation-wise, talking with all the individuals, we agreed that we wanted to build secure quality software, and um, the tickets that I cut were not superfluous. Um, our engineers are extremely talented, they are extremely capable, they know what they are doing. Um, we have a lot of training, we have a lot of documentation, I have this insane triage process to make sure that um, we're asking for the right things. And finally, so um, the trigger, right? So I tried to do this through JIRA. JIRA, for those of you who do not know, is software tracking, uh, sorry, task tracking software. Um, so ideally a teammate would get a JIRA ticket, they would um, 
resolve the ticket in whatever way they saw fit, and we would be rewarded with the secure quality software. But the number of tickets just kept going up, <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, I kind of took it personally because, like, we're in the trenches together. We've gone through releases, outages, incidents, hot fixes, and rollbacks, and, like, you know, we agreed that this was important work. So, you know, what were we doing wrong? So going back to the drawing board, um, I thought maybe it's because every team handles Jira tickets differently, so maybe they just weren't seeing them. So I decided to introduce monthly metrics to the leadership engineering team, uh, sorry, the engineering leadership team, and essentially thereby modifying the trigger. And when I introduced monthly metrics, um, the results were not quite what I wanted, so it stabilized. It wasn't increasing beyond that, but also like wasn't doing any better, so back to the drawing board. <laughs> Um, I realized that most people aren't rude like me, obsessively taking notes uh, when they're, like, they're actually respectful and paying attention when people are, when they're being presented with metrics. Um, also, they're probably not in front of their JIRA boards whenever I'm presenting those kind of metrics. So I decided to include reminder emails to sort of capture that case of, okay, it's in your email, and then the JIRA board is, you just tab over to the JIRA board, and then you can remember to do this, to do this item. So I modified the trigger again. When we introduced email reminders, the number of open tickets dropped dramatically. And when I accidentally broke the script, uh, the number of open issues went back up again. So um, with this, I could scientifically prove that my colleagues were not maliciously ignoring things that I was flagging, um, but rather they needed a kind reminder to do this work. Um, monthly metrics failed because I didn't understand my target at the time. When I zeroed in on reminder emails, that was using the correct trigger to remind engineers of, the, of what they wanted to do. And you know, our memory is really faulty. We only remember about four things at a time. So this was a failure of my part of not understanding my target. Um, so how did I avoid spamming managers and directors, right? I don't want people to hate me. So <laughs> um, I combined all relevant open tickets and emails sent by project, and I organized the information of projects per email by using set default and set. Set default is uh, applied to dictionaries. The key parameter is the key that is used to search for the value, and the default value is what is placed in the value if the key does not already exist in the library. Um, sets are pretty self-explanatory. They are deduplicated lists. So if you apply set to a list of two Carlas, you'll get one Carla back. Um, so I had an email dictionary with all of the different so I'm just using CC, the CC list. Um, and if I already have a value in email and I apply set default to it, then it will print to me Carla because Carla is the default value. However, if the email dictionary is empty and I apply set default to it, it will set a new, brand new default and therefore print the default that I set during set default. So um, why, why do that? Well, this is actually a secure, oh, sorry, I'm so used to saying that. This is actually a Python anti-pattern to like check if CC exists, exists in email first. Um, and also like CC lists are very rarely um, singular, so I needed a list value to put in the dictionary. Um, and this is the wrong way of doing it. So using set default actually looks way cleaner as a result. Um, also, I needed to use sets because I, if Carla had multiple open issues, then I didn't feel like she didn't need to be in the CC list twice, right? So we used the sets to deduplicate that list. Okay, so how did I hack an international corporation's habit? Um, so the year was 20, 20, um, 2017, we had about 800 people at the time. And um, before that, my boss actually caught me with my laptop unlocked when I first joined the security team. Um, so that's him. And um, so I decided, well, I learned pretty quickly that we shouldn't keep our laptops unlocked. Um, and so I decided to challenge myself and my coworkers to change some bad habits. Um, so I utilized the Slack API and I used Python to create a bot to sort of encourage a new behavior in my coworkers. So um, how it works is that imagine that you are walking around the office and you see that a coworker's laptop is unlocked. So you access their Slack client because everybody at our company has Slack um, and you reach out to the bot saying, I slipped. 
as your coworker. And then you can also tag yourself to make sure you get credit for catching that individual. Um, the bot then responds that this person was caught. Don't forget to lock their computer. Um, and I also created um, two uh, leaderboards. One of them was to show how many people had been caught how many times, and another leaderboard was um, how many times people had caught others with their laptops unlocked. So um, the target was all of my coworkers' habits. So the behavioral change was to get people to lock their computers, um, and the motivation here was I don't want to get caught. Also, I don't want to be insecure, right? Um, they had the ability to do so, so there's keyboard shortcuts, there are hot corners, you, we have an auto lock um, policy that's set by our IT team, that's really great, um, just in case people forget. And um, the trigger actually in this case was like watching people get caught in this channel. Um, so it's kind of an anti-pattern, <laughs> which I actually highly discourage, but essentially the reward is not getting caught. Um, the trigger is seeing all these other people getting caught and being reminded, oh, I don't want to get caught. And then the re behavior, the altered behavior in this case is when I get up from the computer, I'm going to lock my computer. <laughs> I accidentally introduced another habit amongst my coworkers, which was catching people with unlocked computers. Um, so they were motivated by bragging rights by far. That was the biggest motivator. <laughs> and um, they were enabled to do so by having a channel or the bot enable them to keep track of who caught who. And the trigger was noticing an unlocked laptop. So they would see the unlock, unlocked laptop, they would reach out to the bot, and they would be rewarded with bragging rights. <laughs> um, so again, this is a completely new behavior that I introduced amongst my peers. Um, so we released this bot into the wild, and some people took it better than others. And um, at the start of the experiment, we actually caught quite a number of people, and towards the end, we caught like less than half. So other unintentional results, um, people run to lock their computers when they see me around the office, like that's a negative feedback loop I, I accidentally built in my coworkers. Um, the bot had started, so I introduced the bot to a subset of engineers, and it actually saturated engineering, and then saturated the San Mateo office, and then went beyond to our Dublin offices, Portland, Seattle, and, um, and, and went far beyond the engineering org. So like people outside of engineering, like product, um, some finance people, they were all starting to play this game as well. Um, we're now at 1,200 employees, and people rarely get caught nowadays, but also the bot has been offline for more than a year. They still will catch people and report it to the channel um, years later. So in this weird way, like, I feel like this truly highlights the power of the feedback loop. So um, to reiterate, behavioral change requires motivation because people need to understand why that they want to change their behavior. You need to have the ability to be able to do it. So I mentioned time, I mentioned resources, I mentioned uh, how easy it was to perform the behavior and the trigger. So you need to understand when you're doing that. And I actually, an earlier iteration of this talk talks about reminders and checklists. So um, again, this habit, habits only can happen in a habit feedback loop, which starts with the trigger, the behavior, and the reward. And these are additional resources that I actually discovered after writing these bots and these um, tools. Um, so I highly recommend learning how to learn um, surfing the motivation wave with Masha Sedova and automating my two with GitHub and Twilio by Alice Goldfuss. These are the free resources. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed my discussion about habits and how I applied Python to alter these habits. Um, feel please feel free to follow me on Twitter. And if you would like to work with an empathetic security organization here at SurveyMonkey, please feel free to apply with our glorious recruiting team. Thank you. And I can take questions if there are any, but yeah. We have time for a question or two, if there are anything. Otherwise. Okay, thank you everyone.